Hi, I'm Susan, and welcome to the second episode of Susan Stanley Stitch and Times Stitched Stories. This episode involves a little girl named Mary we've been talking about, and I'm going to take you through a little bit more about her life in 1840 in St. Louis as we work on a project together. I hope you brought some handwork, some stitching, some knitting, whatever it is you like to do along with you and you'll join me as we just spend some time stitching together and learning about her life. Now Mary, if you've been following me, you know Mary is a composite of a, of a little girl in 1840 that I've crafted to help us understand what early sewing was like and what education was like for young children in that, at that, in that era. Um, last episode, episode one, I talked about how Mary and her mother and grandmother would have accessed fabric. And that was kind of interesting. That was episode one. Today we're going to talk a little bit about how Mary would have been educated or the educational options for children at that time. Specifically, how did they learn to sew? And we already discussed the fact that uh, children, of course, learned from their parents, their elders, any, anybody in their realm that, uh, that they interacted with. And so Mary, this little girl that I've crafted, has a mother who's a mill, uh, excuse me, a mother is a dressmaker and her grandmother is a milliner. And uh, she's exposed to a lot of stitching and sewing in her life. Um, I'm really, really excited about this episode today because I have found a real little girl that I want to tell you about uh, who would have been alive at the same time as my created little girl, Mary. So I have some notes here I'm going to be referring to as we move along because I have so many details I want to share with you and I don't want to forget any, get any of them. So bear with me as I look down. And, you know, this is really intended as a time for us to chat and you to get some stitching done. I will likely be chatting more than stitching, but I hope to get a tiny bit of stitching done as well. Uh, everyone's welcome here. You don't have to be working on the project. Uh, you're just welcome to listen and learn. It's, it's just a fun time to share as stitchers. So how, how were, um, oh, I wanna answer a question really quickly. Um, I do want to answer your questions and I'm going to answer them as they pop up and fit, fit in with an episode. And I did receive a question from the Curious Crafters about waxing your thread. I, if you bought the kit, you know you got a waxer. You also got the papers to make, um, to make a thread paper. And I, I've been using my thread paper. I love it. I really do. I, I think I do believe I will kit a project at some point with red papers because they really are super convenient. And that was in Floss Tube episode 34. Uh, if you want to go create, if you have your kit and you want to use your piece of laid paper to um, make some thread papers, go back to episode 34. If you didn't buy the kit, you want to create, create one yourself, go ahead and, and look there as well. So I typically thread my needle first. And I don't know that this is a necessity, but this is just the way I, I like to do it because I, in my mind, like to keep, um, see it didn't go through clearly on that end, so I'm just gonna try the other end and hopefully it goes in easily and we can get started. Put a little box. Uh, so why, why do I, I like to thread my needle first before I run it through the wax because I don't want to gunk the eye of the needle up with wax. That's just kind of my, that's just kind of been my go-to. So I thread the needle, I, I hold it, I pull it through the wax, and then, you know, I rub it to, to get any excess wax off. And it just helps the thread glide really easily through the fabric. Um, so great question, ladies, and if you have any other questions, please, please, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, so like I said, last time we looked at how Mary would have accessed 
the fabric and how it was laundered and likely pressed. And today we're going to look at schooling for girls and specifically how that relates to sewing and how uh, those skills were transferred in a little bit more formal setting. So our little girl Mary uh, is six years old, it's 1840, she's in St. Louis, and as we've said, St. Louis is a bustling city. Uh, Missouri as a state became accepted into the Union on August 10th, 1821. So it's a pretty new state at that time. And uh, as soon as settlers started to arrive in St. Louis, schools were, were being established. And, you know, of course, people, are, people want all the modern amenities that were available in, across the world. Um, so I'm going to share with you some of the things I've uncovered about schooling for girls. And as I uncover more, I'll, I'll share that with you as well. So in 1840, the schools mostly were established by the Catholic Jesuits, and they were from France and Spain, and some were English, and there were boarding schools and day schools. And there were also other options where uh, women would take in short-term boarders into their home to teach them in an informal setting for months at a time. So that was another way uh, girls in particular, but children, were educated. Now if you remember, if you've been following me in Floss Tube 31, I talked about the view of children at that time being really different than, than what we perceive today. Children were viewed in 1840 as many adults. They were, the expectations on them were, were very high. And uh, I imagine, you know, little Mary was, was held to a pretty high standard um, as well. An essential part of education at that time, and especially for girls, but not only girls, was to learn how to sew by hand. Because remember, there were no sewing machines available to the general population. And St. Louis, if any city was going to have access to, to sewing machines, it would have been a, a bustling city like St. Louis, where there were so many imports coming in, but I don't really see any evidence of sewing machines being used at all um, until later in the century. So expectations were high, like I said, for children, and I want to read you a quote from a woman named Edith White. She's from Nevada County, California. And she wrote this as an adult in 1860. So she was a child, you know, 1840 and before. And she says, before I was five years old, I had pieced one side of a quilt, sitting at her knee, her mother, half an hour a day. And you may be sure she insisted on tiny stitches. So, if I was sitting with you, I wouldn't be insisting on perfection. Uh, I would just want you to strive for excellence, and I want you, you know, if you're, if you're doing this for the first time, this is your first time stitching, I just want you to free yourself from those expectations and just enjoy the process. But know that little Mary likely had somebody having her pull stitches out and do things. Um, she was not going to get away with anything less than top-notch work, um, likely, from what, from what all the stories from adults say. So right now I'm just creasing some lines, you know, getting some things prepped to make more blocks as I chat with you. And as I discussed earlier, girls by 12, all girls needed to have the basic skills of making a shirt, making drawers, making a shift, and making baby clothes. That was essential. They were going to need those skills to go on to live their adult life and establish their own homes, their own families. Um, there was no where else to get these things, these items. That was coming, but it wasn't really readily available. Uh, you know, in St. Louis, there would have been access to more, but 
Um, everyone needed these essential skills, no matter what your station in life. You know, you needed to know what to do. And we've talked about work baskets and all the essentials of scrap bags. Um, so education. I want to introduce you to a gentleman. His name is Joseph Lancaster. And I will put a picture in here. I promise not to make you look up too, uh, too much because <laughs> I know you want to get some stitching done. Um, Joseph Lancaster. So Joseph Lancaster was born in 1778 in Southwark, England. And he was a Quaker, and he had a passion for teaching and helping the poor. And he, on the front of his school, was the quote, All that will may send their children and have them educated freely. And those that do not wish to have education for nothing may pay for it if they please. That's a pretty long engraving tab on the top of your building. But Joseph Lancaster uh, is really credited with a lot of this, this early education. He believed in economy and efficiency of time and use of materials. You know, he's, he was pretty classic Quaker who believed in uh, simplicity and balance and harmony. Um, so as soon as he opened his school in England, uh, there was there were 800 boys and 200 girls signed up immediately, and he had no assistance. So he was kind had opened up this huge, huge kind of can of worms, really. Uh, and what was he to do? Because he he couldn't obviously teach a thousand children on his own. So he devised a system where the more experienced child or the child who had mastered a skill would teach the newer child or the younger child or the child who was still learning a skill. And it was called the monitorial system. And it involved a very unique seating arrangement where the older, more experienced student was sitting at the head of a row of, tape, of a table and they would monitor over the younger or, more, or less experienced student. And so you, I'm going to put a picture in here out of one of his instruction books on how to educate children to give you an idea. Now these are boys and they're, they're, they have their slates and they're learning letters. But this method was used with girls for sewing as well. So let's look at this picture. So that gives you an idea of uh, the way it was done. The monitor w watched over the children in the row and the children in the row could then show their work to the headmaster who was kind of operating, supervising the entire room of, ch of children. And it was kind of, it became known as a mutual education system where the older experience taught the younger. Uh, I've. You know, I know that's been used in schools today uh, with my own children, and uh, this, it was very successful, and it received a lot of philanthropic support. It was actually adopted by the Royal Family Schools, and it was this, this method spread all over the world. It became a worldwide educational phenomenon, really. Uh, it was... What did I read? It was found in Russia, it spread to Madagascar, Peru. Um, it had been used earlier by a, a gentleman named Andrew Bell when he was in India, but Lancaster really improved upon it and, and uh, maximized it. So Lancaster, he really had a heart for, for children and especially the girls as he saw, and we're gonna talk more about the life of a seamstress in England, but he really, he was really concerned about the fate of the children after they left his school. 
because a lot of them, you know, he was in England at this time, a lot of them were impoverished. Uh, they didn't have a really bright future, and he wanted to prepare them kind of like George Mueller, if, you, if you've learned or read or heard much about him. He wanted to prepare them for a life, um, and so he really, a life of success. So he really advocated for girls to learn sewing because he knew that was a skill they could take into their adult life, either into their employment or into their own homes. And this method that he used of mutual education or monitorial system, where the older taught the younger, was established by several charities and it became the sewing and the, the teaching method, sorry, the teaching method um, kind of worldwide. And so I have every suspicion, I have every confidence that the schools established in St. Louis were using this method. Uh, the lessons were incremental, they became incremental eventually and skills were built and as a, a girl would learn a sewing skill, she would make a little sample and put it in a sample book and then she would learn a, a ne the next skill, a little more advanced skill and she'd put that in the sample book and I will talk more about that in the future because those sample books to me are priceless. Um, okay, you see, I talk, I'm talking, I'm not getting much stitching done. I am so excited to see all the progress so many of you are making. I love, love, love the way some people are combining their fabrics in, a, in different ways. Uh, some people are using, making their own kit. Uh, it's, just been really, really, really fun to see that, and I hope I hope you're looking, following the hashtag um, for stitches because it shows a lot of beautiful things. And oddly enough, I think I've mentioned I think I've mentioned it before. One of the one of the highest ranks of sewing was to be able to make a shirt. Now this isn't just you know, we think, I don't know if any of you have sewn clothes on the machine. I know some of you have. Uh, a shirt doesn't seem difficult, but you have to realize that there were a few very tiny pictures in books, if, if that, showing dimensions and kind of guiding you through measuring someone's torso to fit the shirt properly. There was no step-by-step or anything. That was it. You had to know exactly how how that process worked all on your own. And uh, I guess since everybody needed some type of shirt, and because they were so fitted with cuff, collar, bodice, all of that, uh, that was that was a way of measuring that the the, the sewer had arrived. <laughs> they finished their shirt. I don't know that I've ever made successfully a shirt that I felt was tailored and fitted perfectly to my to me, but that was the uh, that was the end all, and it involved a lot of tiny stitches and it was all done by hand, uh, the buttonholes, everything. There were um, we're going to look more at the occupation of sewing later and how and what that was like, but. He, he knew it was not an easy life, Lancaster did, and he, he did, I think he, you know, I believe he had good motives and, and wanted the best for the kids. Although, now, poor Lancaster, he just couldn't help himself. Uh, there was a charity that, that took him on and he was teaching, you know, around the world his method and, and becoming well known and basically totally miss managing his finances, totally bungling them. And so the charity that he founded kicked him out. And he basically uh, kind of failed at his, own, at his own effort, which is kind of sad. But this Lancastrian method of education was, became part of the British foreign school system, and it's still in use today. Uh, 
he had he had established it in hopes of creating good little Anglicans. You know, I think he had the best of intentions. He wanted children to live a life that that was successful and uh, eventually after he kind of lost his funding from the charity, he emigrated to America and he really struggled to make it. Uh, he he was known worldwide and he did he did continue lecturing in the United States and Canada and South America and sharing his methods, but uh, unfortunately it was not going well for him. And in 1838, so not, not too long before little Mary was living and stitching, he was killed uh, in New York by carriage. He was hit, hit by carriage and killed and he died a pauper. So just kind of an interesting story and kind of sad, but his method, his method was very, very good. And you know, it's still, it's still known today and used today, although we may not know, we may not attach that information to uh, where it came from. So in his method, it involved using a piece of Bristol paper or paper, and that's why you have this piece of Bristol paper in your kit. And his, his idea was, you know, how to teach children. Now, we are dealing with a time when there was not a standard measure. There was not a ruler that had a standard marking on it. We'll talk more about that in a future episode as well. But there was no standard seam allowance. It was you know, if you look at old quilts or quilts from that time, you can find a seam allowance from almost an eighth of an inch to maybe five eighths, quarter of an inch. They're all, they're varied. The goal for the children was to have a consistent seam allowance, not so much to have a unit of measure. So that's a huge difference between now and, and then. And so basically, the method that uh, was used in the Lancastrian school, and I think, I think his sister actually is credited more with developing this, this sewing method than him, although, uh, you know, it did involve the monitor at the head of the table, um, watching over them, making sure they were doing it correctly. So they were given their, their uh, fabric, and their piece of paper. And they were to, and, and usually it was a longer piece of paper and a longer piece of fabric. And they initially, their first lesson was to just fold the fabric over onto the paper and then move the paper down the fabric because, you know, let's say we're dealing with a, a bigger piece like this. So they would fold it over and then they'd move the paper down and they'd fold it over and they would have to eyeball, eyeball measure to make sure that the fold and the edge of the fabric were consistent. There was not a ruler to check, they just had to eyeball it. And so they would move down the row with down the line of fabric, folding and checking. Can you imagine little five-year-old children doing this? It's kind of incredible. And they would they would hold the they would hold the fabric with their thumb and their second finger, and then they would press and they would keep that consistent. And then uh, they would you know hold it up. The monitor would check and I think in some cases then the paper was passed to the next person so they were very, they had to be very patient I don't think they each had their own paper um, can you only imagine the second lesson was to create a hem so they were building skills and they divided classes up by proficiency um, you know some kids some children were more advanced and so they were moving on to more difficult skills, uh, 
and again, it was still that Montessori system where the, the older, experienced child would teach the younger. And so, you know, the, the little boys in the photo, in that, in that drawing from his manual, um, are sitting in much the same way as the, the young girls would have been sitting for their st stitching. And so I was reading through the manual, and it's so, everything was very formal, it was very regimented. Uh, the monitor would give, a sm was, would be given a small bag of supplies by the headmistress. Every girl would put on her pinafore, and they would have a case of needles to pass out. Each child had a needle, and they were responsible for returning the needle when they were done. They were given a pin cushion with pins, and the children were given the pins, and they were responsible for returning them when they were done. And they had thimbles, uh, and then they had threads and thread papers. And they were given, given that, and then there was a pair of scissors that was passed down the line as needed, um, along with the, with the paper. And all of the sewing was worked in hand, and then upon completion, the materials were, were returned to the head monitor. And I, I found it really interesting, too, in the manual, um, that the children were often given colored thread because it was thought that it would be easier for them to see if they're, they were being proficient with their stitching, but also uh, they thought it would be fun. For the kids, so I'm, I mean, there was some, there was some levity and there was some fun in it. And uh, now my sister doesn't like to sew, so so she hears about this and she just immediately goes, Ugh! she thinks it's terrible. But you know, I like to sew. I I probably would have liked that that type of education. But their work was inspected by the monitor and the headmistress, so it wasn't, uh, you know, and if it wasn't up to snuff, they had to take it out and do it again, and it was, uh, you know, it was building a proficiency and a skill set for adult life. And, it, and like I said, it was very regimented. There were a lot of bells as I was reading through uh, his manual. There were a lot of bells ringing. These kids, you know, they had a bell to take their seats. They had a bell to pass out the pinafores. They had a bell to get receive their needle and thimble and thread and fabric. Uh, it was it was quite something. But you know, that was just a, the way it was done, or the way the way he set it up. Um, and then, you know, they would have a bell even to, to do this crease line. You know, they'd ring a bell and everyone would, they'd crease and then they, when they were done, pass it. And when everyone was done, then the bell would ring again. <laughs> it's like you'd go home from a day of that and your head would be ringing. Uh, and then on Fridays, the girls could bring whatever they wanted to sew on, their own personal projects. So maybe they were making outfits for their dolls Perhaps they were working on their marking samplers. I mean, anything else that they were doing, they could bring at that time. Uh, Fridays must have been great days for them. And so, like I said, some of these girls were in boarding schools, and some of them were, uh, they were in schools that for just a, a period of time in someone's home. Now, was this Lancastrian method taught in homes? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, it sounds like just the watchful eye of whoever was sitting next to the child was, was the method that was used. But uh, anyway, it's just, I just find it really interesting and very different than how we learn today. So now you have a little bit of an answer as to why this paper. I hope you're getting used to your thimble. If you're trying a thimble for the first time, I hope it's starting to feel more comfortable and uh, a regular part of your of your hand. You know, for stitching this, it's not as crucial. 
but when we get into the heavier quilting and the binding you're going to be really glad that you that you got comfortable with the thimble so i do i have to I have to admire Lancaster and his vision, and I have to give him credit because I don't, I don't think I'd heard much about him and his, and this worldwide method, prior to really diving into this information. Uh, even though he couldn't manage his finances, he seemed to, to really have a vision for helping children learn, and I have to admire him for that. I also have to thank uh, someone who I've mentioned in the past, and that's Melissa Roberts of Two Threads Back. I gleaned most of this information, if not all of it, from her and, and some other reading, I guess, that I have done. Uh, she's a wealth of knowledge on plain sewing and early education uh, and uh, learning to sew for children. So thank you, Melissa. If you if you want to read a delightful blog, you should go go check out the Two Threads Back. I know I've mentioned it before. I'll link it below. It's it's just so pleasant, just lovely, just an eye, a window into the past that, of course, I find fascinating. So I can't stop with, without telling you about a, a discovery that is so exciting to me. I just can't stand it. Um, so little Mary, as you know, you know she's a composite of, of children that I've read about and experiences that I've read about. She's not real, although she feels, she almost feels real at this point. It's so fun reading comments from people. People are creating their quilt and imagining what her favorite colors are and uh, just, you know, she, she does become real because I think in some ways we can kind of relate to her. Uh, no matter what we learned to do as children, we, we do remember childhood uh, and those experiences and they are dear to our heart. But uh, very, very exciting. I want to share with you uh, one little girl in particular, but two little girls and two real little girls from this area during this time period. Now, I mentioned earlier that Missouri became a state in uh, 1821, August 10th, 1821. And not long after Missouri became a state, there was a young girl named Martha Ann Beebe, and she was eight years old, and she lived in St. Louis and she lived in St. Louis in 1824. So she, uh, I'm gonna put a picture of her marking sampler in right here. She stitched this marking sampler in St. Louis. I don't, I haven't uncovered a school that she was associated with or where she learned to stitch her sampler, but I, I know you will love to see this sampler from this very, from this time period. So, you know, little Mary was not any different and she would have also stitched a marking sampler, but right now we're talking about her doll quilt. So let me put in Martha Ann Beebe's marking sampler for you to look at. It is housed in Colonial Williamsburg, and this sampler was a way for little Martha Ann to prepare for adulthood. And so, you know, we've talked, to, we've talked about sewing, preparing these children for adulthood. This little marking sampler prepared her in ways that were uh, deemed important for, for children to learn. Uh, she was learning patience, she was learning obedience, she was learning refinement, uh, she was learning skills for future employment or just for use in her own household. Uh, so little Martha Ann, you know, she was probably 
along the lines of an adult by the time Mary was was on the scene, but they very much very well could have interacted. And then there's a young lady who I can't even tell you how excited I was to find out about. Her name is Susan Bushy, and she was 11, and she created a decorative sampler or needlework picture. Um, sometimes we call everything with words and letters a sampler, but actually I think there's a little more definition to the categories. And this little girl, Susan Bushy, went to a boarding school. It was a ladies boarding school. It was in Brunswick, Missouri. She was 11 and in 1838, she stitched her sampler at the Fourth Methodist Episcopal Church School in St. Louis. So she would have been around when our fictional little girl Mary was around. And I just was so excited. So let me put her sampler in here. So that was Susan Bushy's needlework sampler. Now, her sampler is housed at the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it was done with linen and silk. And she attended this ladies boarding school in Brunswick, Missouri, according to what I've read. Now, it seems kind of strange that she would be sent out 200 miles away from a bustling city to attend school, but I need to learn more about this school. Uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church School. And if you know anything about that, I know there are people stitching along with me who, who grew up in St. Louis and who live in St. Louis and who know quite a bit about St. Louis. So if you know anything about that, I would love to hear what you know. Uh, her sampler was pictorial and it was, you know, more advanced. It's showing that she's arrived at a level of proficiency and it shows a picture of the church school on the on the front and the flora and fauna of the area. Uh, I think that's really exciting. So Susan and Mary might have known each other if Mary was a real little girl. We can just pretend that she was, but Susan was a real little girl and she did live in that area at that time. And her, you know, these samplers were hung in the home and people could come in and admire the proficiency of the young woman. Uh, suitors would, would frequently, you know, this was a way of showing that she was a woman of discipline and uh, skill and that she was uh, going to have her, her abilities brought into a marriage or just into establishing a home. I just, it's very interesting and very different, of course, than today. So I was so excited to share that with you and I do have to thank uh, the St. Louis Art Museum for their their help in tracking a little bit more down about Susan, Susan Bushy. Um, they, they were extremely helpful, so. I hope you got some sewing done today. I did a tiny bit. I got some things prepped. Um, as always, I've just enjoyed chatting and opening up a little bit more of the world of our little girl Mary and what she would have what she would have been exposed to as a as a young child in her education. Next time, we'll take a look at something else, another aspect of her life. And uh, I hope you'll join me. There's tutorials up now if you're stitching the doll quilt along with me. If you are interested in a kit, those are still available. And I'll be back with some floss tube and more stitch stories in the future. So in the meantime, make time for stitching. Bye, friends.